Well, it's good to see you this morning. We are glad that y'all are here today to worship the Lord with us. If you will, stand with us as we open up to do so this morning. Let's sing. You're calling, you're calling, you're calling us to the cross. Indeed, Jesus Christ is calling us to him. He's calling us to see what he's done for us on the cross and that he rose victorious before us. He's calling us each by name because he knows you by name. He knows every detail of your life. He knows your faults, your failures, and he still calls you to him. 
Are you coming to him? Are you coming to Jesus, looking to him this morning? I hope so. We're so glad that you're here. If you haven't already taken the information card out of your bulletin, please take it out, fill it out. And then when you leave at the end of the service, just drop it in the offering drop boxes at, at the back of the sanctuary. Let me lead us in prayer this morning as we focus upon the Lord and his goodness. Oh, Father God, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you draw us, you call us, that you know us by name. You, you encourage us to look for you and to see you in our world and even here today. So we open our hearts and our minds to you. We thank you for your presence, how you call us through our worship and through your word today. May we hear, may we respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen. reading this morning from Isaiah chapter 6 says this in the year that King Uzziah died I saw the Lord high and exalted seated on a throne and the train of his robe filled with the temple above him were seraphim with each six wings with two wings they covered their faces with two they covered their feet and with two they were flying 
and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Who has commands all the host of heaven? Who else could make every king bow down? Who else could whisper and darkness tremble? Only a holy God. What other beauty demands such praises? What other splendor What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. So come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy forever. could rescue me from my failings, who else would offer his only son, who else invites me to call him father, only a holy God, yes, only my Heavenly 
Father God, we thank you that you have provided a way, Father, for us to worship you in spirit and in truth through Jesus Christ our Lord in the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives. Father, we pray today, may it be an anthem of our heart each day we seek to worship you, the Holy God. Thank you, Father, for your holiness. Thank you for your righteousness. Father, may we seek to live in accordance to your truth in your life. It's in your precious name we pray this morning. Amen. You may be seated. We are in a series of me messages entitled Christianity is evidence-based, and we're looking at many of the evidences of God and the Bible, the reliability of the Scripture. And so I invite you to take your sermon insert. We're going to be looking at a lot of things and covering a lot this morning. But in the last couple of Sundays, we've been talking about why some people reject Christianity, why they reject the Bible and say the Bible is not true. And we've looked at several things, but last week and today... We're, as point number three says on your outline, some people reject the Bible because they say it is unscientific. Many people say the Bible is unscientific, and because it's unscientific, I just can't believe it. I can't be a Christian. I can't accept Christianity, so I reject the Bible, and I reject Christianity. Well, we've kind of used two verses for the focal uh, passages concerning the question of the Bible and is it scientific. The first was in Psalm 119, verse 160. Psalm 119, verse 160 says, All of your words are true. All of your righteous laws are eternal. The Bible doesn't have errors in it. The Bible does not contradict itself. The Bible is not unscientific. All of God's words are true. And then in 1 Timothy 6, verse 20 and 21, the Apostle Paul was writing to the young Timothy and warned him about some things that were even common in his day and even seemed to be so much more common in our day as it says in 1 Timothy 6, verse 20, 20. Timothy, guard what has been trusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter. And the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in so doing have departed from the faith, grace be with you all. He says, in our world, there will be people who have a lot of godless chatter. They talk about this, they talk about uh, their philosophies and their beliefs and their understanding and their great knowledge, but they leave God out of it. And then he says, be careful of that which is falsely called knowledge. And we talked about last week, the word actually for knowledge there could be translated, and it is in some translations, science. He says there are a lot of things that are falsely called science that are opposing ideas. They're actually a belief system that leaves God out. And by these falsely ideas, uh, things that are called knowledge and science, many people are led astray. Some people, even some church people, become disillusioned with the faith, disillusioned with Christianity, thinking that it cannot be true because they keep hearing all this godless chatter and these opposing ideas of things that are called science, called knowledge, but is really not. So we're talking about this. Is the Bible unscientific? And should you reject it on that basis? Well, last week we talked about a couple of things. Number one, I just put them on your outline. It's important to understand what science is and that science has limitations. We can't go into all those Im limitations. We talked about that last week. Look it up on uh, YouTube, Facebook. You can see the message where we talked about the limitations of science. Secondly, science and Christianity are not incompatible. In fact, many of the great scientists of the past were Christians, and many of the great scientists of today are Christians. It's not incompatible to be a believer in Jesus Christ and the Bible and to be a reasonable, scientific 
person, in fact, is completely compatible. God is the creator of science. And then number three, the Bible is not a science book or a medical book as such, but it contains some information that is scientifically and medically correct, and it revealed it long before the world finally discovered it. We gave several examples of things in the Bible that you could call medical or, or you could call scientific. And the Bible, of course, was written long before many of these things were discovered in our world. So that's important to understand. And what we want to talk about today is, number four, there's often a difference in what some people think the Bible teaches and what the Bible actually teaches. It's so important to understand this. It's often a difference, and it's often a very large difference between what some people think the Bible teaches and what it actually teaches. There are some non-Christians, some atheists, that think that the Bible teaches many unscientific things because they have been told the Bible teaches unscientific things. They've had a professor or there's been an atheist or just maybe some of the friends they hang out with and the Bible subject comes up. And they say, well, you know you can't believe the Bible because it's filled with so many things that are unscientific. And kind of like with the contradictions uh, that are supposedly said to have in the Bible, if you ask them and say, well, what unscientific things? Many times they will not be able to tell you anything. They've just always heard it, that the Bible teaches unscientific things, and so they think that it's unscientific, and therefore you're foolish if you believe the Bible or become a Christian. And then another situation is not just is sometimes people told that the Bible is unscientific, but sometimes there are believers, they're Christians, and a subject comes up, and they say, well, you know, I believe such and such. And the person in the group or says something, well, why do you believe that? And the person says, well, that's what the Bible teaches. And the other person says, well, that's unscientific. You know, how could you believe that? The Bible teaches that? And so they say, well, the Bible must teach this, whatever it is, that it's unscientific. And because that is unscientific, you know, I can't believe the Bible because, you know, the Bible teaches unscientific things. So that's kind of a problem we have in our world is that sometimes and quite often people think things about the Bible that are not actually true of the Bible. And in regards to science, many people think the Bible teaches unscientific things, but there's a big difference in what they think it teaches and what it actually teaches. Now, I want to give you a few examples. I'll put you some uh, examples uh, on your outline to kind of see how this thinking goes, how people think certain things and then how they get that thought and then maybe what the Bible actually says. Let's just first of all think about the earth. Is the earth round or is it flat? People may think different things about that here today. People through history, uh, by and large, have thought that in distant history, thought that the earth was flat. Christians and non-Christians mainly thought the earth was flat. Some Christians believed that the earth was flat. It was like a square because there are some passages in the Bible that talk about the four corners of the earth. And they say, well, a piece of paper has corners. A lot of tables have corners. Uh, a square has corners. And so since the Bible talks about the corners of the earth, the earth must be flat. And they say science would say the earth is not flat. They would say the earth is round. And so the Bible teaches things that are unscientific. So I can't believe the Bible. But is that actually the case? Does it... Bible actually teach the earth is flat and has four corners. They specifically talk about the four corners. Well, I gave you those references of where the Bible refers to the four corners of the earth. And remember, we we've been talking a, a good bit, particularly when we talk about contradictions, that it's important to read in context. Don't just read one verse, but read it in context. And also, remember, often the Bible uses symbolism to speak of things. And so when the Bible talks about the four corners, it is generally talking about the furthest extents of the directions. You know, we talk about the north, east, south, and west. 
And so when the Bible talks about the four corners, it's talking about the extent of the reach. Oftentimes the context is talking about the reach of God or the work of God or is calling his angels from the four corners. It's not saying that they're sitting on literal corners of the earth waiting for God to call them, but they're working into the furthest extents of the world in all directions wherever God has accomplished God as he's doing his work. So the Bible talks about the four corners of the earth. It also talks about the four winds. It's not talking about their four literal winds, that there's a west wind, a north wind, or east wind, and those are the only winds that blow. We know winds take many directions. But it's talking about the extent of the working of God, the fullness, the furthest reaches of the earth. Keep going west. You all go out to the corner. You, you, you out there first. You go that way. You go that way. It's, you're going. So does the Bible, what does it say, what does it teach about the earth? And is it flat or is it round? What does it teach about the earth? Is it flat or is it round? Well, let me remind you, the primary purpose of the Bible is not to teach you science about the earth. It may kind of surprise you. It's not to really teach you, is the earth flat or round? That's not the purpose of the Scripture. The purpose of the Scripture is to teach you about the creator of the earth, not necessarily whether it is flat or round. So it doesn't have a whole lot to say about that because that's not its purpose. But it does say this in Isaiah 40, verse 22. God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. The point is, it's not what people think the Bible teaches. It's what it actually teaches. And so if somebody says, you know, the Bible is unscientific because it teaches this, then you say, well, I need to study. I need to study to see what the Bible actually teaches, not what somebody says the Bible says or what Christians ought to believe, but what it actually teaches. Or then here's another thing. What holds the earth in place? What holds the earth in place? What keeps the earth just from going selling off in any direction or whatever? What holds the earth in place? Well, in Greek mythology, it says uh, there's somebody holding the earth on his shoulders. Remember who that is? Atlas. And you've seen statues, you've seen pictures of, of Atlas supposedly holding the earth in place. That's according to Greek mythology. In Hindu mythology and Chinese mythology and some other ancient cultures, they believe the earth is held in place not by a, a great giant, but by some great animal. Like there's a gigantic turtle called the cosmic turtle that the earth sits upon. And then some believe it's not a turtle, but it's a giant elephant that the earth sits upon. And then some believe it's, it's not a turtle, it's not an elephant, it's a gigantic snake. That, ew, that's scary, just think about it. You know, I don't want to be down there close to the snake, you know, being held up. But it's the snake that holds the earth in place. And when there's an earthquake or a shaking of the earth, it's because whatever animal is holding it in place has moved or the elephant has shifted its feet. You know, so all these mythologies have these teachings about what holds the earth in place. Well, does the Bible teach any fantasy or any mythology like that? No, it doesn't. Well, some atheists say, well, you know, the Bible teaches something just about as bad. The Bible says that the earth is held in place by giant pillars that hold it in place. In fact, I put in your outline 1 Samuel 2, 8 and Job 9, 7, where it talks about the pillars of the earth. The pillars of the earth. And so people say, well, there you got it. It's not an animal, but the Bible teaches that there are giant pillars that hold the earth in place. No, it does not teach that. First of all, it does not say the earth is held in place by giant pillars. It doesn't literally say that. It says they're pillars of the earth. And the Bible, again, is often speaking metaphorically or symbolically in its language. We know this is often the case with pillars because in 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, it says the church is the pillar of truth. The church is the pillar of truth. Does that mean we are a concrete column? 
No, some churches have concrete columns and marble columns, but the church is not a concrete column. What is a pillar? A pillar is something that sustains something or holds it up. It's not talking about it literally being a concrete pillar that the truth sits upon. But it says we as the church, the people of God, are to constantly, continually being holding up and presenting the truth of God. That's one of our primary purpose as a, as a church, is to hold up and set forth the truth of God in a world that's going apart from God and in a world that is falling apart. It is the truth that will hold the world together, not the opposing ideas of, of our world. So, does the Bible tell us a lot about what holds the earth in place? No, it doesn't. Because it's not a book on what holds the earth in place. But it does say this in Job 26, verse 7, that God suspends the whole earth over nothing. What's more scientific, you know? He holds, he suspends it over nothing. God holds it in place. So don't discredit the Bible on the basis of what some people think the Bible teaches. There's a huge difference oftentimes between what some people think the Bible teaches and what the Bible actually teaches. Now let me give you another example. This is how people think the Bible teaches something different than it actually does teach. This is not so much a scientific thing, but it just illustrates the point how many times people think the Bible teaches something when it actually doesn't teach that. What does the Bible say about slavery? There are a lot of people who think the Bible encourages slavery. There are a lot of people who think the Bible teaches that it's perfectly fine with God to have slaves. Some Christians thought that the Bible taught it was okay to own slaves. There were many non-Christians who owned slaves, and there were many through history Christians who had slaves. Generally speaking, Christians treated their slaves differently than non-Christians because of the things the Bible did say and does say about treating other people. But because some Christians owned slaves, and because even some Christians used the Bible to say that God had endorsed it or okayed it, many other people say, well, you know, the Bible just teaches things that I can't accept, and so I will reject the Bible. But as you think about it, and think about the formation of the Bible, what it does contain, the things that it tells, we know that throughout history, Slavery has been a part of much of ancient history in almost every culture. In the Bible, the Jews were enslaved by Egypt. In the Bible, the Jews were enslaved by the Babylonians. The, ba the Israelites at times had slaves. The Romans in the New Testament day when Jesus was on earth and then we have the record of the Gospels, they had slaves. So the Bible many times discusses things as they are, not always as they should be. So it, the Bible in many ways records history. It's not a book of all history, but it does record history and records things as they are. So don't fall into the faulty line of thinking that saying that the Bible records something that must be the way God wants it. The Bible records a lot of sins. It's not saying that God wants us to sin. It's recording the way things are. But since we're talking about this and how many times people misinterpret the Bible and what it teaches and what it actually teaches, let me just talk a little bit about slavery and what the Bible teaches about slavery. Again, as I said, um, it records slavery. But one of the big events in the Old Testament, when the, if you think about some big events in the Old Testament, is the exodus, the bringing of Israel out of slavery. If he'd have wanted them to stay in slavery, he'd have left them in slavery, but it, that was not his plan for them to stay in slavery, so he brought them out of slavery. Another big event in the Old Testament is the bringing of Israel out of slavery to the Babylonians. So we see that God is bringing people out of it. When you read in Genesis, you read how God made mankind he made mankind with value and worth. 
the value and worth of mankind is not based on man. It's not based on just our natural coming together of matter by chance. It's based on the fact that God created us. Our value and worth is bestowed upon us by our creator rather than just because we exist. And the Bible teaches that that value and worth of mankind is for all mankind, regardless of their background, regardless of what they've done, regardless of their skin color or nationality, their value and worth is given by God. Then in the New Testament, like the book of Philemon, it talks about a Christian named Philemon who had a slave named Onesimus. At some point, Onesimus ran away from Philemon and he ran into the Apostle Paul. <laughs> Not just a chance meeting, it was the design of God. Onesimus ran into the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Paul you know, had to tell Onesimus about Jesus and obviously Onesimus became a Christian and Apostle Paul said, I'm going to send you Onesimus back to Philemon and I want you to carry a message to give to Philemon and this was the message basically that Paul sent back to Philemon concerning Onesimus. He said, I could command you what to do, but instead I'm going to appeal to you on the basis of love. Receive Onesimus, not as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. Receive him in love. So you, you see this teaching and this idea concerning slavery, and we see it even playing out in our own country, in America, Although Christians and non-Christians held slaves, it was primarily Bible-believing Christians who led the effort in abolishing slavery, even in the founding of our country and with our founding fathers, who most of which were Christians. They put it in our Constitution, the very framework of our country, the means of correcting our nation's ills. For example, it says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a what? Some of you know it. Many of you have it, obviously don't. In order to form a more perfect union. Then, so, saying we're forming a constitution that will enable us and allow us to form a more perfect union. They're saying, our union right now at the start is not perfect. But there's some things we need to do. And so we need to form a more perfect union. Now, our founding fathers could have said, we're not going to become a nation till we're, till we're perfect, till we get, got it all together. But that's not what our founding fathers thought. They said, we need, we recognize their faults and failures, with even where we are right now. But we want to lay the groundwork within our documents and how our country is to operate so we can become more perfect, a more perfect union and, and nation. By the way, that is how God works in us also. You know that? When you become a Christian, you're made perfect in your standing before God, but you're not made perfect in all of your behaviors, are you? You know, in fact, in Romans, it said, uh, the very things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. It says, I struggle with carrying out the holiness and the purposes of God. So when God saves us, when he makes us into a holy nation, we're made righteous with God, but then he's working day by day to make us a more perfect child of God. We call that sanctification. And God does that with nations too. The Declaration of Independence says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and they're endowed by their, what, creator with certain unalienable rights. Where did they get that from? They got that from the Bible. And it says we need to know these teachings of the Bible in order to create a more perfect union so we can live in accordance with God and his design. My, my point is in saying all that is, some people will say the Bible teaches this and this and this, and therefore I can't be a Christian. But there's oftentimes a huge difference in what the people think the Bible teaches and what the Bible actually teaches. So don't let someone snooker you into rejecting the Bible because they say it teaches this or it teaches that when in fact it does not. And then number five, the presence of miracles in the Bible doesn't make it unscientific. 
See, we're talking about why people reject the Bible. Some people reject the Bible because they say it is unscientific. And the reason some people say it's unscientific is because it has miracles. And miracles are not scientific. And so if the Bible records miracles, then I must reject the Bible because I want to be scientific. I want to be reasonable and logical, not believing in fantasies. Now, let's talk about miracles a little bit. If you look in the Bible, depending on how you define miracles, and we're going to define them in just a minute, but most people would say there's about 250 miracles in the Bible that range over various different things in the Old Testament and the New Testament, about 250 miracles. Some people may say there's as many as 500. Some people may say there's as many as about 100. But we just, let's just say 250. It's a lot. There's a lot of miracles in the Bible. What is a miracle? Well, here's just a simple definition. I put it on your outline. A miracle is a rare or unusual event where God intervenes to change the normal or the expected way things are. It's a rare event. It's very unusual. And God is intervening in the world to change the way things are or the way things normally happen. Let me expand it just a little bit. Probably won't be able to write all this down. But a miracle is an event occurring within the human experience, but it cannot be brought about by mere human ability or the functioning of natural laws. And so it must therefore be explained by the intervention of the divine or the supernatural. And so you kind of get the gist of that. A miracle is an unusual event that takes place within the human experience. In other words, we, mankind has experienced miracles, supposedly, the Bible teaches, is in, within the human experience, but it's not something that happens because of just the, a human's ability to do it. it. It's not something that happens because of a natural law, of like gravity. You say, well, that happened because of gravity. Take No, it's unusual. It, 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 it's not in keeping with that. And so you can only explain it by saying God did it. It was a divine event. So that's kind of what a miracle is. Now, sometimes we, we use miracle kind of loosely, kind of in a very broad sense. We use it to describe something that's just great or fantastic, something that uh, uh, happens that's wonderful, you know, like, um, like the birth of a child. You, know, you, you see that child born and you hold that precious baby in your arms and, and you say, that's a miracle. You know, that, that is a wonder, a miracle of God. Well, not really in the technical sense. It's not a rare or unusual event. They occur about every second, you know, in the world. So it's not an unusual event. It's not really outside the, of the human ability. You know, the child is born, you know, of flesh. It, yes, God is involved in it, but it's not really fitting the definition of a miracle, a rare or an unusual event that is outside of the natural laws and only can be explained that God made this child suddenly appear. No, no. Or sometimes we say things like um, in sports when some tremendous play happens you know, and the team scores or wins the game and pulls it out from the mouths of defeat or whatever they say, well, that was a miracle. That play was a miracle, you know. Well, it may be fantastic and incredible and may not happen in every game, but it was not like some natural law was suspended as the guy went up into the air and he sailed through the air maybe for 15 minutes or stopped in the air midair. You know, it, it, we call it a miracle, but it's not. Or like some of you may have children graduating and say, boy, it is a miracle my child is graduating. I don't know how they made it because they didn't study. I, I'm not saying that about my child that graduated yesterday, but, but you know, some of you would say, yeah, it's a miracle my child graduated. That's not what we're talking about, a miracle. We're talking about an unusual event where God intervenes. Now, another thing about miracles. God does, doesn't do, when he does a miracle, at least the, the ones we have in the Bible, he doesn't do them just randomly. He doesn't just do them, oh, I think I'll do a miracle. And boom, there's a miracle. God had purpose. He had design in the miracles he did. 
Part of that is why it's, they're so rare and unusual. So let's just talk about this idea about miracles and how some people think, well, I can't believe the Bible because it's unscientific because it contains miracles. So on your outline, A, and we're just going to get right to the heart of the matter. The real problem some people have with miracles is with God, not with the miracles themselves. That's the real problem. The real problem many people have is not with the miracles itself. The real problem they have is with God. Miracles are only possible if God exists. Remember the definition of miracles we said it, it, it can only be explained by the intervention of the divine or the supernatural. So a miracle cannot happen unless God exists. And so some people, they, 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 they do not accept God. So they have to reject a miracle. They have to find some other way to explain it. And generally they try to si sound very scientific in their discounting of miracles because at the root of it is their rejection of God. And if they just come out and say, I reject God, that makes them, as the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. So they won't appear not foolish, but appear scientific. And so they'll say something like, well, our world functions on the basis of natural laws. A natural law is something that we can observe and that it happens in this way and it repeatedly happens in this way so that we can predict that tomorrow it will happen in this way, whether you're talking about the law of gravity or whatever. It's a natural law. It is predictable. It is repeatable. You can, you can test it and run it and get the same results. A miracle would be a suspension or a diversion or somehow uh, negating that natural law for something to happen. And since natural laws are constant and, re and constantly being repeated and consistent, therefore they can't be miracles. And so they would say it is unscientific to believe in miracles. That sounds scientific, but it's really reflecting just a disbelief in God. It's not really dealing with the miracle. It's disbelieving God, which brings us to the second thing, B. It is not scientific to search for answers to the way things are in our world by excluding possible answers from the start. For example, if you are a scientist and you're studying things, why things are the way they are or why things happen, and so you have a hypothesis, but you say, I'm going to exclude all, I'm going to exclude a certain answer for a possible answer to this problem or this hypothesis, it will skew then your results. And if you say, well, I'm a scientist and I'm going to look at the pos possible answers or solutions to this in the world or why things are like this in the world, but I'm going to exclude God from any possible explanation, then your results will be affected. And yet that's what many people do. They say, I'm going to approach the world and the state of our world by excluding God from the picture. And like we said last week when we talked about the limitations of science, we said one of the limitations of science is that scientists are often biased. They're human. And so they're often biased in their approach to what they do. Let me give an example. David Humes was a Scottish philosopher and historian who died in 1776. He had a lot of things that uh, he spoke concerning science and, and the world and the functioning of the world, and he influenced a lot of people. Here's one of his famous quotes. No testimony can be adequate to establish the occurrence of miracles. No testimony can be adequate to establish the occurrence of miracles. What is he saying? He's saying, I don't care what the evidence is. I don't care what evidence you put forth for a miracle. It cannot be God. It, it cannot be true. Isn't that crazy? What if you were doing a case and, and you brought witnesses on the stand and you say, I don't care what this witness testifies. It cannot change the verdict I've already decided. That's not scientific. And yet that's what David Humes, who professed himself to be so uh, uh, scientific and reasonable in his thinking, said no evidence, no testimony can be adequate for the establishment of miracles. And not only that, another one of his famous quotes is, a wise person should never believe in miracles. A wise person should never believe in miracles. That 
Godless chatter is very common today. If you're wise, you will not believe in miracles because there cannot be a God who does miracles. What a pitiful person. Oh, by the way, let me tell you another one of his famous quotes. This one is not repeated as often because it doesn't fit in real good. But this quote was made on his deathbed. And on his deathbed, David Hume said, I am in flames. Not really surprising for someone who said there is no God and only a fool would believe in miracles. So if you're looking at something, trying to discover why things are as they are, and you start out by leaving God out, you're going to get some skewed results. And that's the way it is in our world today with so many that leave God out, and then they say, well, the Bible's unscientific because it includes all these miracles. We know miracles can't happen because there's no God. And then C, some people say that they don't believe in miracles because they've never seen one. Well, I've never seen a miracle, so there, you know, can't be anything such as a miracle. We've, we've talked about this a good bit in can you only believe in the things you actually see? Well, first of all, by definition, a miracle is a rare event, very unusual. I'm convinced not everybody sees a miracle. Now, there's some things that God has worked in your life. You may say, and people, you know, tell me, I think somebody told me earlier early service, well, I've seen miracles. I've seen God do miracles. It may come down to the definition. I'm not saying God doesn't work in your lives in unusual, magnificent ways. But I'm saying that you, the Bible days, they, you know, there are these miracles. Well, I haven't seen an axe head float. You know, I haven't seen the sun stop. I've seen an eclipse, you know, but I hadn't seen the sun stop, you know, so I haven't seen one. Well, it, as we've said before, do you only believe in things you see? Do you believe in your mind? I didn't say your brain. You can see your brain if you cut your head open. Well, if you cut your head open, you probably won't be looking at your brain. You don't want to see it. You may not be allowed to see it. But can you see your mind? Your mind is the working of your brain, how it processes information. No, you can't see it. But I hope you believe in your mind. If you don't believe in your mind, you're probably not as smart as you think you are, you know, because it's functioning. But yet some people say, I have to see a miracle to believe it. We're going to talk about why that's kind of dangerous also. But just someone who says, well, I've never seen a miracle, therefore I, I won't believe him, it's really not a good argument because we, believe, we all believe in things we cannot see physically, but they're, they're real. And then D, it is reasonable to believe that a supernatural God can perform miracles. It is reasonable to believe that a supernatural God can perform miracles. If there is a God, as it is described in the Bible, then it is very reasonable and very logical to believe that miracles can happen. If there's a God, like the God of the Bible, it's very reasonable to believe that miracles can happen. Look at Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. You've made the heavens, you made the earth, you made everything on it. Nothing is too difficult for you. You know, somebody said that if you can accept Genesis 1-1, you won't have any problem with accepting anything else in the Bible. Remember what Genesis 1-1 says? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you'll accept that, that God created the heavens and the earth, all the stars in the sky, all the universe, you won't have problems with any other miracles. Now, I may not understand how a miracle occurs, but that doesn't mean God doesn't understand. In fact, have you ever noticed that God knows a lot more than we know? But a lot of times we want God to fit our mold. We want God to fit our thinking. And so we say, because I can't understand how this could happen, certainly God couldn't, or, or certainly it couldn't happen. But listen, if God can only understand what I can understand, if God can only do what I can do, then he's not God. He's just like me. And who wants to worship me? You know, or, or you. You know, a God who's just like me and you is not worth worshiping. God is infinitely above us. And his understanding 
and what he can do. So that nothing is impossible with God. And then E, people who say miracles are unscientific or impossible because miracles would violate the laws of nature, and that's impossible. They don't understand God, and they don't understand the laws of nature. Again, this is what many people come back to about miracles. They say a miracle is a violation of the law, of laws of nature. And the laws of nature are consistent. They are unchanging in our world. And if you say that they are suspended or changed or something intervenes in them, that cannot be so because you can't change a law of nature. But for someone to say that does not understand God and or they do not understand the laws of nature. We kind of already talked about not understanding God part, but let's talk about the law of nature for just a second. What are laws of nature? Laws of nature are simply the way we describe the way things function in our world, the way things like gravity seem to be consistent and, re and they happen over and over again in the same way. We call these the laws of nature. It's not saying, by calling them a law of nature, it's not saying that nature created them or create na nature came up with these laws and nature, whoever nature is, said, you know, I'm going to create a law by which the world functions. Or, or another way to say it, is, is laws of nature were not things that evolved. You know, people say that you know, everything evolved, you know, animals came from this one cell microorganism and all these other things evolved from nothing and, you know, and then they, they would say the laws of nature evolved. But how did that happen? I mean, just take the law of gravity. When did the law of gravity evolve? When did it come in? Did it come before the rocks or after the rocks? If there was no law of gravity when rocks were here, what would the rocks be doing? They'd be having rock battles all the time, I reckon. They'd be floating around or whatever, you know? Uh, you know did they come before this or did they come before that? You know, it makes no sense. It's not that they evolved at some point with everything else, like, you know, the, if there's time and space and matter, which of those evolved first? If you have matter, but it evolved before space, where would it go, you know? Or if it evolved before time, when would it be there, you know? So the, the, the evolution stuff has problems. But a law of nature is not something that evolved through millions and millions of years. It is a law that God has made for the governance of our world. In fact, God has designed what we call these laws of nature so that the world functions in a predictable, reliable way, but it is God that sustains even the laws of nature. He holds them together. He enables them. In Colossians, it says he sustains all things by his power. They're not laws that somehow evolved and then we discovered them. You know, we discovered these things that God already made and, and set into motion with the foundation of the earth. The, the laws of nature do not govern God. God governs the law of nature and all of the earth. Let me just give you an example of this and talk about the Sabbath. I've put a couple of examples on your outline concerning the Sabbath and what it was the law of Moses, what we call the law of Moses. But in Luke chapter 6, verse 6, it says, On another Sabbath, Jesus went into the synagogue and he was teaching, and a man was there who had a right hand. His right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse him. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath because their law said you not do any work, not do any healing on the Sabbath. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful, which is right on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And then in Matthew 12, verse 8, Jesus said, For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He said, Jesus said, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath laws are not meant to control me, for I'm the one over the, over the Sabbath itself. And I work within the Sabbath to accomplish my purpose. Remember, we say God doesn't do it just a miracle just for no reason, but he has purposes. The same thing with the laws of nature. The laws of nature are not over God. They do not control God. 
God is over the laws of nature. And if he wants to intervene in one of his laws to accomplish his purpose, he's God, we're not. So if somebody says, well, you can't violate the natural laws. You don't understand God, or you don't understand the laws of nature. And then F, we're fixing to really go high here, fast. Jesus believed in miracles, and he perform, performed them, and so should, I should also believe in miracles. Jesus believed in miracles. He performed miracles. So I should also believe in miracles. John 20, verse 30. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are recorded that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and believing have eternal life. So, I mean, I look, so Jesus did many other miracles, many other signs. We have just a few recorded. You can't just imagine the miracles Jesus did. That these did, he did so you believe. Jesus did them. So I believe him. Jesus, because of his life, because of his burial and resurrection, you know, pretty convincing evidence that what he did was of God. And then also, and this is very important, G, God may be merciful by not showing you more miracles than he's already shown you. It may be that God's merciful. And where am I coming from? Many times people say, you know, God, if God will just show me a miracle, if God will just do a really big miracle, then I'll believe in him. You better be careful what you ask for. If you ask for another miracle. Because we have examples in, in the Bible of people who saw miracles, a lot of miracles, and people who didn't see a lot of miracles and how God dealt with them. Luke 10, verse 13, says, Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sodom, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes, meaning grieving over their sin. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sodom at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. So, What's happening here? In this passage of Scripture, it's talking about Chorazan. It's talking about three cities, Bethsaida, Chorazan, and Capernaum. These were areas in what we'd call North Galilee. It was an area which Jesus spent a lot of time. You know, we've been through the book of Mark on Wednesday nights, and we've been seeing where he's talking about he in Capernaum and he in Bethsaida. Jesus traveled through this area a lot. And when Jesus went through this area up in North Galilee, he taught and he performed miracles over and over again. And the people of these three cities saw the miracles, a lot of miracles, but they would not believe. By, generally, they would not accept Jesus. He's, and Jesus said, if all these miracles that I did in your viewing had been done in Tyre and Sodom, they would have repented. You know, Tyre and Sodom, the Bible tells us, that they got destroyed by their sinfulness. He said, but if they had seen all these miracles, they would have repented. It's going to be worse for you than it will be for them in the judgment because they had a lot of miracles and they still didn't believe. And these had few, but they were judged. But it's going to be worse for you. So look at what it says in Luke 12, verse 48. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with a few blows. For everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. So people ask for miracles. Say, if I just could see a miracle, then I would believe. But what happens? They don't believe. Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum, they had a lot of miracles. They didn't believe. And so he said, it's going to be rough on you in the judgment because you had so many reasons to believe, so much evidence. So be careful about asking God, oh God, if I could just see another miracle, I would believe. It may be that God's being merciful by not giving you another miracle because he already has given you many, many miracles, which brings us to H. People tend to reject even the miracles of Jesus. It generally, it doesn't matter how many miracles people see if they accept Jesus or not. It's generally not a miracle. Remember, it's a God thing. 
It's a God issue. It's not a miracle issue. And just an example of that, Matthew 12, verse 38. Some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law said to Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Give us a miracle. Jesus answered, It is a wicked and adulterous generation that asks for a sign or a miracle, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so the Son of Man shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. See, get the picture? They come to Jesus, and they say, Jesus, if you would just do a great miracle, if you'd just do a biggie, then we'd really believe upon you. And Jesus said, no, no, you are a wicked and adulterous people seeking another sign, another sign and a miracle. If you read the context just before this from Matthew 12, Jesus has just done a miracle. He, he healed a demonic, possessed man who had various expressions of the possession by which he was being harassed. Jesus healed him just like that. They saw it, along with all these other miracles that Jesus had been doing, and they said, Jesus, if you would just do another miracle, then, then we would believe. So you say, uh-uh, you're wicked. Your heart is hard. You see, a heart that is hard will not accept any miracle. A heart that is hard will not accept any evidence. That's why when I started this series, I said, this message I, I, is not going to convince a hard-hearted person. These messages are for, for those whose hearts are tender before God who are seeking truth by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, okay, I'll give you one more miracle, and even that you won't accept. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, the miracle of Jonah. He says, I, the Son of Man, will be in the earth. I'll be buried, and I'll, raise, I'll rise from the dead, the greatest miracle of all, the power over sin, the power of death. You want a miracle? believe the resurrection. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He's alive. You want a miracle? Believe it. Don't keep resisting belief, the evidence for Christianity, for God, and for his love for you. He we, we started out singing, he's reaching out to you, drawing us to the cross, drawing us to the resurrection, drawing us to himself so that we can know him and be saved. Do you know him? Are you a child of God by belief upon him? Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you do reach out to us. You draw us. Even now, some here, some online have not believed upon you. They know a lot in their head about you, but it's never been transferred to their heart where they submit to you, trust in you for their life. May they do it today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. Who else could rescue me from my failing? Who else would offer his only who else invites me to call him Father? Only a holy God, only my holy God. You come and behold him, the one and the only God. You be seated for just a moment, please.
right, well, it's that time of year again. And, uh, you know, it's funny that Hal brought up graduations in his sermon because there are a couple graduates here today that we would like to recognize. So real quick, can I have A.C. Ritchie and Eli Cassidy come on up here? All right. So this is A.C. AC is uh, he has graduated from Buckhorn High School. Plans to go to Calhoun. Loves him some history, which I think that's one thing we share in common. And he plans to pursue a degree in history to be a history teacher. Is that correct? That's awesome. You know, I was actually in school to be a history teacher before I went into the ministry. So that's really cool. Do a good job. I'm very proud of you for that. Do well. We have these little um, books that we usually like to give out. Now this is. I told them earlier. This is. It does say class of. But, you know what the cool thing about the Lord and the way it is, is that God's word is timeless and it is timely. So this is a book about God's promises, and although it was printed in 2017, it's still relevant, or re- relevant today. This is Eli. Eli is also graduated from Buckhorn High School, plans to go to Calhoun. He is working in, in this, um, sorry, this summer, he plans to work as a machinist apprentice in June, and he hopes to travel a bit before then. We're, we're, we're very proud of both of you. We can't wait to see what God does in your lives. How about a round of applause for everybody? All right. Now, Eli, this is where you give a speech. We love you guys. We also have some college graduates that I would like to thought that made you feel old, this is going to make you feel old, especially if you've, you've been going here for, for many, many years. So first off, we have Peter Zwalen, who just graduated from UAH with a bachelor's in science in, here we go, industrial and systems engineering. He's going to be, he's already working for Northrop Grumman on their IBCS program. I'm not smart enough to know what that is. And he plans on pursuing his MBA. Marcus, Peter's older brother, also graduated from UAH with a bachelor's in science in industrial and systems engineering. Can't tell their brothers. He plans to work for a defense contractor here in Huntsville, and he also plans on pursuing his MBA. Now, here's the one that's going to make you all feel old. I know it makes Hal feel old, so I'm going to stand over here and look at him as I say it. Hal's youngest daughter, Harley, Graduated from the University of Tennessee with a degree in linguistics and plans to work for the FBI. Really, really cool. She also, she saved up some of her own money while at school, and now she plans to kind of go travel abroad for a bit before going into the workforce. So we're very excited whenever these kids grow up and graduate high school. We're also excited when they go off to college and graduate college. It's, it's exciting to see uh, the very capable and good young men and women they become. It does make us feel very old, Hal. How long has it been that you've been here? 35 years here. So if you've been here that long, you watch all his kids grow up from little babes. Two of them graduated college, and now one of them's married. It's a passage of time is is, is, is kind and cruel sometimes. So thank you, graduates. You're awesome. Thank you all for being here. You're dismissed.